to change on a Wednesday evening of moving from your practice into research. In some way you've come from a day where you've been doing something and yet there's a turning round that's kind of inspired you to be here tonight and a quaint kind of uh, edgy where am I at this moment? And maybe that's all part of the, the research question. But a very warm welcome to you all. There are a different group of people who come from Sesame, people who have come in here for the first time. So a welcome to you, and a particular welcome to Robin, Professor Robin Nelson, who's come from Central School of Speech and Drama, our yeah. other half in the Sesame Institute. Yeah. So nice to come in. There we go. We're just starting. To these uh, evenings, Wednesday evenings of research, which Sesame started, it's all right, don't worry. <laughs> Sesame started in 1964, and in those days there wasn't much research being done, there was hardly any drama and movement, there was nothing practice based in the arts. And Billy Linfist had her dream, and out of that began to do, began to do quantitative research around how sesame works and for about five or six years there was a great history of very good research that was up to the market and then it fell away. We began to develop the training and getting practitioners working but the research fell back and we got a bit frightened of it. Then uh, sesame came to central and we got the course into a place that had good academic clout and was working in drama and the marriage of central and therapy became a really important link but the research got lost somewhere. So what we've been trying to do in these research evenings is bring us back to a friendship with research that it doesn't become something of the high and, and godly of Mount Olympus, but it comes down to the earth planes of we're doing it anyway and trying to support each other in this. So this, these Sesame Research Evenings are attempting an ordinary feel to this big subject of research. This is our seventh evening. Seven is a magical number, Robin, so you may be magical, we will see. But just to, for the sake of the video, which I'll tell you about in a minute, we've done seven so far. We've had Sharla Gibbons, who's one of our PhD candidates, looking at PhD process. We've had somebody called Andrew Royal talking about being in research not and not being in research. The whole thing of phenomenon, phenomenology never say the word. We've had image to image, Richard Davis looking at venereal research. He had an explanation after that, but it was something about the beauty, finding beauty as a means of research. We've had Dimpy Hirani, a sesame practitioner, looking at how you can make qualitative research into numbers, how qualitative and quantitative meet each other. We've had our first doctor, Dr. Tanya, fish out of water, looking at the whole place of sesame, academia, soul, pedagogy, psychology. Is it possible, if you're bold? And our seventh one this evening is the idea from professional practitioner to practitioner researcher this nuance that we're already doing it, but we don't know that we're doing it. So number seven, an important one. Just to speak to the video, we've had throughout these series of research evenings, people from overseas, Sesame International, trying to come in by Skype, and we've had thuds and bolts and blooms <laughs> and, and vibrations and computers being moved around the place, and it hasn't really worked. So what we're trying tonight is to record this so we can put it straight onto YouTube so our practitioners from overseas can be part of that. So if anybody's got any objection to that, make sure your voice isn't heard if you don't want to go international <laughs> all over the world. Disguise it. Disguise it, yes, <laughs> that's right. Yes, exactly, yeah. 
But we're just going to spend, because this is a sesame evening, we're going to spend a little moment doing something. Because sesame believes, I think in, in alliance with this evening, that you start by doing. We try to hold this, even though we're, trying, we're, we're working towards a research edge. And Robin says in his description of this evening, as he answers the door, <laughs> the open sesame. Open sesame. Open sesame. <laughs> Welcome, we're just starting. We're talking about the explanation of this evening. Robin talks about the small but significant adjustments required to reframe genuine inquiry through professional practices research in the context of the academy. Say that again. The small but significant adjustments required to reframe genuine inquiry through professional practice as research in the context of the academy. So I'd like us just to meet in twos or threes for a moment and have a very short conversation about your practice doesn't need to be drama therapy or even creative arts. The practice you're involved in. Just tell somebody else in two sentences about that. Have an exchange, and then I'll come back to you for the next bit. The timing is right. Okay. So you've represented your work, still staying in the same groups. I'd like you with your partner or partners to use what they have said to create an imaginative research methodology from what you've heard. What? <laughs> okay, okay. We're bringing in imagination here. So someone's told you about their work, and it's as if you've heard it as if it's a research methodology. Say it back to them, play. Okay. So just for yourself, last bit, last bit, what you've said, what you've heard, and what small but significant adjustment might be given back to you through somebody else saying this could be recognised. Just for yourself, no more than that. Just flag it up. What you said to somebody else what they heard and when asked to play with it could give back to you. And how that adjusts your primary position of it's only just my practice. Who I heard at the PhD conference at Central School of Speech and Drama and I was kind of there because my supervisee was there and I was kind of, as a duty, was to support her. And then this professor came on, and he was full of inspiration. I thought, well, maybe he's worth just saying, would you come and speak to our small but shy group of sesame people who are around this area of research? And he said yes. And so a very warm welcome to you, Thank you. and to the subject of the scene. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's curious that you mentioned academics from Mount Olympus, because I've just come back from a week in Turkey, oh. in the village where Olympus is, below Mount Olympus. Oh. I don't claim to descend from the gods, I didn't climb the mountain. <laughs> and I do like you think research needs to be made more accessible. Um, it, it really worries me that the government has this sense that we live in ivory towers, and they have this, what they call now, the impact agenda, where we make our research relevant, as if we hadn't been operating in the real world, whatever that is. So, I'm happy to share my ideas about how uh, a lot of things that you said earlier that people do in their practice might be research, and I say might, because they're not always research, um, but very often they are, and so that's the approach I'm going to take. So I'm going to address you as practitioners, whatever your practice might be, and then I'm going to talk through what adjustments I think you need to make to turn that practice into practice as research.
So, um, it might help, just before I actually start my slides, to think about, um, already the words quantitative and science have been used in, in this room. And would I be right in assuming that that's what you think research is? That it has to have a scientific base? And that that may be quantitative? No, that's no. no, good. But we've been healed for that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm constantly surprised that the academy still seems to operate on that underlying assumption. Even though it's not the case, even in the sciences, that, that quantitative work is, uh, is dominant. Um, but it does still hang around, and there are reasons why I think that is. But I think to help frame things, if we think of knowledge along the kind of spectrum, with quantitative at one end, qualitative perhaps in the, the middle, and what I'm going to talk about is a new uh, paradigm research methodology, which I'm going to call performative research, mm. a, a, a phrase that um, Brad Hazeman, a colleague in Australia, coined, so I must credit him with that, but performative research. So it's doing thinking. And in, historically, in Western culture, there's been a binary division between thinking and doing. I mean, we can trace this back certainly to Plato and probably further back than that. But um, research is thought of as a thinking thing and a writing thing very often. People write books, they write articles, they have them peer reviewed, those kinds of things. And then practice, doing, is something else over there, separate from research. Now, that, in my view, is an outmoded binary, um, which I, I think is unsustainable. But interestingly, we had a guest lecturer yesterday talking about ethics to uh, colleagues and PhD students and so on. And it seemed to me the whole basis of everything he said was in the old positivist paradigm of science. Um, and it, it's just, it keeps coming back at you in that way. So if you think of that kind of spectrum of supposedly objectivity at one end, which is usually associated with the quantitative end, and subjectivity at the other end, we're kind of sliding along those, that spectrum, but we'll, we'll be more down the qualitative, subjective end, I think, in what we're talking about. So the question then is, uh, if knowledge is defined in terms of objectivity and quantity, then the kind of things we're engaged in probably couldn't be research. And there are some universities which still have the scientific method, whatever quite that is, written into their regulations about research. You know, research is to be undertaken according to the scientific method. And there is one university, and I better not name names, that changed their regulations under the weight of argument for other modes of research because it was inscribed in their regs. So you can see how it's kind of institutionalised. I'll perhaps come back to that later. But that's the kind of frame. So, um, from practitioner to practitioner researcher, that's the journey we're going to try and take together this evening. Do feel free to ask or comment as we go along. I know after the break there's a kind of Q&A session where we can perhaps explore how your practices map onto what I'm going to say. But if you have, you know, if you want to ask a point of qualification and make a, a comment, please do. My mantra is this, articulating and evidencing a PAR, practices research inquiry. Articulating and evidencing a PAR inquiry. So, where as Mary suggested, you in the practices you're engaged in, you may be engaged in research. What you're perhaps not doing, if you don't think of yourself as a researcher, is articulating and evidencing your research inquiry. So the first adjustment that you need to make is to become aware of what your inquiry might be. The the reason why we've had to kind of formulate a new or and argue for a new research methodology, practice based research or practice as research, is because um, various practices have been drawn into the, the academy, into the, the higher education sector, where research is generally seen to be. Um, part of people's roles, besides teaching, they should engage in research to inform their teaching and so on.
So the way I see it is that different spheres have come together, and I have three in this diagram, the top one's not really clear, it's the arts world, I have the media sphere, because I talk a lot about media in this context, and academic sphere, but all kinds of cultural practices might be added around that um, diagram, and where they intersect, we may have practice as research, where they come under the protocols of the academy. So there are different accents on the word research, and I think it's just useful to unpack them a little bit, because research is used quite often. Personal research, finding out and sifting what is known. I wanted to buy a new digital camera recently, so what do I do? I research it. I go online, I find out what cameras are available, I read the which reports, you know, that kind of thing. And we talk about that as research, but it's not academic research. People might be employed in the role of researchers, particularly in the media. Um, people are employed as researchers. Their role is networking, finding sources, collating information, but it's not academic research. Academic research involves conducting a research inquiry to establish new knowledge. So again, that's key. It's about new knowledge, or we use a slightly softer phrase, which I think I've got here, substantial new insights. Mm -hmm. Which is perhaps rather better. So if you just think for a moment about the practices you're engaged in, it may well be that what you're developing if articulated in research terms, would reveal substantial <coughs> new insights. If you develop a new way of doing things, a new therapeutic process, a new approach to therapy, a new approach to writing, for example, if you're just doing it, it's a practice, and that's fine. But if you want to turn it into research, you have to articulate and evidence the research inquiry and the substantial new insights that they've yielded. Could you say that again? I'll try. I'm going back. Where was I? Um, so I said that you, know, you may be engaged in practices where you're um, discovering new things. You might be testing out a new approach, which might prove to be very successful. And if it does, that could be just a good practice, which is helping the people you're working with. If you want to turn it into a research outcome, you'd have to articulate the research inquiry you are pursuing in testing out this new <coughs> method, and you would have to e somehow evidence the research inquiry. And I'll be talking more about that as we go through. So, um, it might also help us to have in mind a distinction between knowledge and knowing. I mean, knowledge sounds like it's a hard, quantifiable, solid, objective thing in the way we use the word. Whereas knowing is processual and is constantly in, developed, in development. It doesn't become fixed. And I want to argue that knowing, in that sense, is equivalent to knowledge. It's a different mode, if you like. And there's a lot that might be, be said about that conceptually, but I'm just going to move on and we can come back to that if you wish. So what we usually call propositional knowledge is verbally articulated, and it's the cornerstone of traditional research. It's the kind of thing people write up in academic papers, which they send to referee journals, which get published as new knowledge. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not objecting to that. What I'm objecting to is that being seen as the only mode of knowing. That's one mode, it's useful, but it's not the only mode. Then there's all kinds of practical knowledge, articulated in the knowing doing of praxis. And at the moment, it's less fully accepted in the academy. It is quite widely accepted in a lot of different disciplines and spheres but it's less fully accepted. There's always this kind of pullback, as I said, to sci the science and quantitative um, facts and, and so on. 
So one of the shifts that we're having to make in the academic community is to make the case for this kind of knowing or practical knowledge to be accepted as worthwhile, as valuable. We've come quite a long way in what I call the Practices Research Initiative, which has been going on for 20, possibly 25, 30 years, but certainly 20 years in the arts in this country in particular. Um, the UK and I think Australia perhaps are really the field leaders in practices research. It's most developed there. Curiously, <coughs> the, um, there are other areas, Scandinavia is quite strong, South Africa it's accepted, particularly in the applied theatre context, interestingly in South Africa. In America, it's spurned, and I'm not really quite sure why that is. I've got some speculation. Um, I'm just I'm writing a book at the moment on practice research, which I hope will be out next spring. And I'm writing the first half of the book on this kind of stuff that I'm talking through tonight. And colleagues from around the world are um, writing chapters in the second part. And I have somebody from um, the States, and I've asked her to try and explain why she thinks there's so much resistance to practices research. It's quite hostile, even bilious at times, and I don't quite see why it should be. Perhaps we'll come back to thinking about that. But generally speaking, I think in the UK certainly, we've established that arts, media, and other performative cultural practices, or practices in twice there, may constitute academic research. It's generally accepted, I think, in the UK. There are still people who don't, you know, don't like the idea, and it's certainly regarded by scientists as problematic. But it is broadly accepted. In formal institutional terms, for example, there's a national audit of research, again, in 2014, called the Research Excellent Framework, and um, colleagues can submit research based in practices to, um, to that um, research audit. So you could submit therapeutic practices to that audit. They are, in that sense, acceptable, in, in formally acceptable in the research domain by the Higher Education Funding Council for England. So, in one sense, it's not a problem, but it's about a cultural shift, and the culture shifted quite a long way, but it's not shifted as fully as I would like. So, artworks and processes may be submitted as substantial evidence of research. Now, I've used two terms. Uh, in talking, practice as research and practice based research. And they're pretty much interchangeable, except that I prefer practice as research because I mean by that that the practice itself, whatever it is, will be submitted as substantial evidence of the research. Whereas practice based, although th this is the term that's mainly used in Australia, and my colleagues m in Australia mean by the practice-based research, what I mean is practice as research, but it still suggests to me that the, the, the practice is something that the research follows the practice, it isn't the practice itself. So why I emphasize the term practice as research, because I want to stress that the practice is the research, and, and is substantial evidence of the research. And then we've also um, got accepted modes of presentation of arts research which might map on to more traditional methods. And I'm, go that's, I'm going to be talking about how I think that, that might work. So I don't, I'm against binary separations really. I don't want to say, you know, we do this and the scientists do that. There's actually quite a lot of correspondence if only people would look at what's actually happening. Because most scientists work in laboratories and they conduct experiments. They're doing things. Their research is through doing, and through thinking doing, in similar ways to which we might say our work is through thinking doing. The difference is that they tend to come up with quantitative data as the findings of their research, and we don't, by and large. That's the difference. And I'm interested in what the quantitative research is 
that you talked about before, so you can tell me later what that was. Because generally speaking, in practice research, there isn't quantitative data. But there are links between the methods, and we can learn usefully from each other. So, what would a practices research submission look like? In my model, it's likely to include a product, which could be an exhibition, a film, a blog, a score, a performance. It could be a workshop. But it must have a durable record in university protocols. That's a, a condition inscribed really in, in university regulations. And it hasn't really been directly challenged, but it could be. And it's been indirectly challenged in the sense that some things which were accepted in research um, maybe don't have infinite durability. The usual way of documenting your practice is to record it in some kind of means, on a video camera for example, and that would usually be then edited down on a DVD and the DVD will be submitted as um, the part of the research evidence. It could be a CD, it could be a video. And of course, DVD and videotape is not infinitely durable, but even words on the page fade over time. So, you know, we can argue about that later. So it has a product, and then the second thing it would have is documentation of process. Now, I've come more and more to think that the insights, the substantial new insights, come out of the process as much as the product. I won't say more than the product, but as much as the product. So, in creative arts practice, if people are making choreography or making a piece of theatre, they were very keen in the beginnings of the debate about practice research that their work, which they privilege, is the research. Now, in one sense, I'm saying, yes, I agree with that, and it is evidence of the research inquiry. But in fact, quite often, the real insights is how you've achieved that outcome, how you got there, that journey. So in fact, documentation of the process, by a variety of means, sketchbooks, photographs, DVDs, all kinds of um, objects of material culture that might be used here, is very important. Okay. The third thing is what I call complementary writing, which includes locating practice in a lineage of influences and a conceptual framework for the research. I need to unpack several bits of this. The first is my phrase complementary writing. There was much debate which still goes on a bit, but you hear it much less now, in the early years of the Practices Research Initiative, about why people had to write about their work. People would say things like, if I could write it, I wouldn't have to dance it. Now, in some sense, I, I understand that, because there are different modes of articulation. But... For all kinds of reasons, in order to articulate and evidence the research inquiry as opposed to the creative artwork, it's helpful to submit some complementary writing with the practice itself. I'll run through just a few reasons why I think that's so. If you go to the theatre and you see a performance, you don't normally, you're not normally looking at it as research as such, but if you were asked to look at it as research, you might say, well, there's so much going on. So it's not that I'm denying that a piece of theatre could be research, it's just that it could be research into the lighting, or the sound technology, or it may be that the movement is captured by motion sensors and triggers the, the sound. 
it might be innovative in design, it might be exploring a new vocal approach, they might be working, you know, there's so many possibilities it might be, but there, there needs to be a clear research inquiry. So in many complex pieces of artwork, there could be half a dozen research inquiries. I'm finally talking about um, a piece called Centrist Geographies, which was made by a choreographer, a colleague of mine, with some, some uh, other uh, researchers. And it involved people coming into a space, it was a church in fact, um, in, when I saw it, which was a space. And these, these were non-dancers, people off the street, so to speak. They were invited to come and move in the space. The space um, had all kinds of uh, motion capture sensors running across the space. And as you moved, you triggered the sound. And you began to learn that the way in which you move could, could actually begin to create music with the sound. And then you realised that if you operated with other people through your movement, you could begin to make an ensemble of sound. Okay? And then there were other people who knew, other people who watched watch this process going on. So where's the research inquiry in that? There could be several. I mean, some could be technological, just making all this stuff work, you know, the motion sense and so on. It could be choreographical, in terms of a new approach to choreography, found vocabulary and so on. It could be musicological, it could be all those things. But if, if I'm asked as an assessor, uh, as I am professionally asked to assess the practice of research, how do I know what it is? So the minimum I need is a clue. If someone says to me, first of all, well, the research inquiry that I was interested in was the choreographical practice, that, that's, I know that that's what I'm looking at. And then if they get to say a little bit more about why they think this is innovative choreography, that helps me to see what the research inquiry is. Then I can begin to see, see the, the piece overall as evidence for that research inquiry. Without that clue, I've quite often been stuck. So that's the beginning for me of complementary writing. And once people have accepted that principle, you find it opens out into all kinds of other things. So take the next phrase here, locating practice in a lineage of influences. If research involves substantial new insights, that kind of implies we know what the old insights are, what established insights are. So unless you look at what other people are doing, in work in similar territory to yours, you're not able to say what new insights you're producing. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that in your own practice, I hope that will be clear. So if you're working in drama therapy, let's say, there are an established set of practices of drama therapy, which are, if you like, old hat. So if you're using those, they may be very effective with your community, and that's good, good social practice, but it's not research. If, however, you develop one of those practices in a new way and try it out and that proves to be even more effective, then you've done something new. And if you document that in the way I'm talking about, you are bringing out a substantial new insight. So locating in a lineage is simply knowing what are the established practices in your field, whatever your field is, and then looking at what you're doing and, and bringing out how it's different and how it's yielding new insights. It's the equivalent to what um, traditionally is the, the literature review in a PhD process. If you're working in a very narrow field of research, you're supposed to have read everything that's been published in that field. Okay? So you know what knowledge has been established, and therefore, you're in a position to say what you're, how you're, what you're doing is adding new knowledge to that little heap. You know, when I initially did my first research degree, my supervisor said it was like the pile of stone. You, you, you add the stone to the can. I don't like that model, by the way, but that's how it was put to me. But you can see the point. And that, you, know, you need to know what everyone has built, and then you added your little bit, and then someone will come after you and add their bit, and so on. So it's the parallel for that, and it's simply being aware of what other practices are going on in your domain. So if your domain is drama therapy, to know what's going on in drama therapy, and then to be able to say, okay, yes, I'm doing, but I'm doing this differently, and this is the new insight I'm producing. And then the third part that I want to unpack here is the conceptual framework for the research. If we're engaged in intelligent practices, 
it seems very likely to me that the kinds of things we're inquiring into will also being, will be being inquired into in other domains, in, in the broad sense of the academy. So, in terms of reading, and I do believe people should read <laughs> around their research, um, but for me it's a kind of opening out to what people are doing in other areas and making links there. And I use the word resonances a lot. Because again, it's not that one explains the other. It's not that the theory, you have to have theory to explain the practice. It's both ways. You can have insights through doing things which can inform theory or help, you, help people better understand theory. And you can, of course, read something abstractly that helps you clarify um, you, your practice. So for me, it's a dialogic relationship between those two things. So if I'm supervising a PhD student, they will set out on a reading program cognate to their territory, not necessarily narrowly in it. And I ask for a practice review more than I ask for a literature review. I ask for a practice review because that seems to me most important in locating your work in a lineage. And I'm not over keen on literature reviews in the traditional sense because most practices research in the contemporary world tends to be interdisciplinary. So what is the discipline in which you're going to be, have specialist knowledge? It's likely that your work will map onto different kinds of things, onto philosophy, onto some aspects of social science perhaps, onto, you know, whatever, it's traditional science, if you like, you know, bioethics or neuroscience. You know, these, are, these are things in the contemporary domain. There's a lot of work between neuroscience and dance at the moment, for example. So it's not looking narrowly in the dance frame, it's looking about you and saying, well, what other ideas are circulating in contemporary time? culture. Oh, what they're doing over there, that's interesting, that's quite like what I'm doing, but they're doing it that way, and, I, and you find that resonance, and that's what I ask students to look for, and so far it works. So you then find key um, conceptual framework influences, and then you perhaps read more deeply in those, uh, those areas. I'll come back to the problem of interdisciplinary work in a moment. So, I think that, uh, before I go on, I'll just wait there. So, there, there, there are the three dimensions, and I'm going to um, deal with that in diagrammatic form in a moment. So, I was just thinking about applied theatre and what it's called. I don't know if you like the phrase health theatre, it's an American phrase. I'm not sure I like it really, but maybe, of course, that. Um, but vehicles for communicating experience of people with disabilities and special needs, and special needs. And ethnodrama has script, is um, producing scripts based on data. So this is where your writing, for example, might map onto um, uh, some kinds of drama therapy. Ethno theatre and performance ethnography are closely related terms where performances are based on data. Now, I've put data in inverted commas there because it's not a word I often use, um, but it begins to um, map on to the scientific model of data. And then drama, drama as a means of personal growth might be another dimension. I mean, these, these are not exhaustive, I'm just making suggestions here. And in that area, what is tacit needs to be made explicit through critical reflection. And that's another key aspect of my model, which I'm nearly getting to. So I'll talk about the tacit and the explicit in a moment. I'm moving on too fast, just shout, but I can leave these slides with Barry if you want to come back to them. So, if it's also clear that there is such a thing called practice research and this is how you do it, why are there misunderstandings? Why do people doubt it? Well, in creative practice, 
I think there are, there are was, and to some extent still is, a misplaced sense that all devised work is original in the sense of fresh articulations, but it may not be original in research insight. So if you make a piece of theatre, or you compose a piece of music, or you make a piece of choreography, or you conduct a drama therapy workshop, um, it may be original in the sense that that particular workshop only happens that once, and it's original. But that's not what we mean by originality in research. Similarly, if it's a piece of theatre, it may be a, a new devised piece, but it might not be original in terms of its principles of composition. It might be quite like a lot of other pieces of theatre people have seen, and not offer new insights. So that's why I think some practices are research where others aren't. And it's quite difficult sometimes to say which are which, but that's the task in, in the academic sphere. Um, another thing that I've discovered, particularly since working at Central and applied theatre contexts, is that the motivation and emphasis is on the social project and can detract from the research inquiry focus. Let you ponder that for a moment. I mean, if as a professional practitioner you're working with drama therapy, and you see that primarily as a social project with good outcomes, it helps people in various kinds of ways, that's fine. But if that's really your emphasis and your motivation, you may lose sight of the research inquiry you defined at the, at the outset. So it's very important to keep a both end going if you're going to be a practitioner researcher. If you lose sight of research inquiry, you drop back to being a practitioner. And that's absolutely fine, of course. Not everybody wants to be a researcher. And people do very good things to their practice in all kinds of fields. But if you want to be a practitioner researcher, you've got to keep both things in play. So, adjustments that you need to make. Here we cut to the chase. You're a practitioner and you're going to become a practitioner researcher. What do you have to do? Number one, specify a research inquiry at the outset. Now again, I choose my words carefully. I don't talk about a research question, which is the traditional way of phrasing this, because questions imply answers, and very often we don't come up with answers, but we do come up with substantial new insights. So, but you must identify a research inquiry, and that's easier said than done. Colleagues at Central find this quite difficult. Yeah. So that you know, people who are engaged in practice or are primarily practitioners, and I come along and say, well, of course you are conducting research, but you need to identify your research inquiry. It's not as easy as it sounds, but you have to do that. And you may need to do that in dialogue with people. Secondly, you need to build moments of critical reflection into a timeline. So you need to know how long this research project is going to run. So if it's a PhD and it's full time, the standard timeline will be three years. If it's a research project you're doing professionally, you need to mark how long you think it's going to take. Let's say six months. In a small project might be undertaken in six months. And I really do recommend drawing up a timeline and putting it on your wall so you look at it every day. So on that timeline will of course be a range of activities because it's practice and research. So there'll be a range of, let's say, workshops that you're doing. And if you want to test something out, you might say, well, how many workshops do I need to do this? Maybe I need six. So if it's over six months, I'll do one a month. And you, you map those in, and you obviously organise that in your professional context, and you know that's going to happen. But you have to build moments of critical reflection into that timeline as well, because practices of all kinds are very engrossing and engaging, and they draw you in. And in a sense, you have got to have some detachment from them. You need to step back from time to time and ask yourself, am I still pursuing my research inquiry? It might have changed, and that can be fine if it's a justifiable change. But it, you need to do that, so you build that in, you know, every fortnight, let's say, you ask yourself those questions. It's really important. 
Then you need to document process and capture moments of insight. So how are you going to do that? So if it's a, a creative arts practice, you're, you're you know, making a piece of theatre in a devised way over you know, three months, there will be lots of process sessions, rehearsals we normally call them. So what do you do? Do you video record every rehearsal? Well, apart from the fact that that would probably interfere with the process, isn't a very good idea, it's logistically quite cumbersome to do that, and you end up with hours and hours of footage that you don't really know what to do with. So you need to be selective. You need to try and capture those moments of insight. So how do you know when they're going to occur? Because you're just setting out on the journey. It's a, it's a genuinely difficult challenge. But just being aware of it at the outset is really helpful. And being aware of the range of doc uh, means of documentation that you have, you know, photographs, videos, sketchbooks, notebooks, all kinds of things, you need to know what they are. And in my last university, we, we ran an MA which prepared um, people to engage in practice research, and we spent a whole weekend fairly early on solely on different modes of documentation, some of which are very creative, incidentally, but let's not go there just now. So people know what the tools are, what the toolbox is, if you like. You know it's there. And you can um, get things, uh, you, 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 can, you need to know where they're readily accessible when you need them. That ought to happen to hand. So if it's a piece of theatre, to take my example forward, the first two or three weeks are just getting the process going, aren't they? You know, you, it's going to be two or three weeks in before getting anywhere. But you begin to sense maybe things are coming together. That might be a point where you bring the video camera in and record it. Yeah. Another way of thinking about this is looking back on a process that you've undertaken. In the light of what I'm saying, if I said to you, right, OK, can you present that now as a research inquiry? And you say, oh, I wish I'd recorded when that happened, because that would really evidence. What you've got to do is preempt that. You've got to look from the beginning and say, ah, oh, maybe in week five something interesting will happen. It's a kind of difficult pull me, pull you kind of thing, but it is important. But it's like you need to have that kind of sixth sense almost of when something interesting is about to happen and then make sure you capture it somewhere. People tend to over-document, I have to say, and I can understand why, for fear of missing something good. But there is a problem if you end up with just too much stuff and you, 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 it's, there's so much you don't know where to start. So that's a difficult one, but it's important. And what you're trying to get is those moments of insight, those things that say when you look back, say, God, I wish we'd have got that moment. It was, you know, that would have really illustrated it. You need to locate your practice in a lineage of similar practices. We've dealt with that one. And you relate your specific inquiry to broader contemporary debate. And I put in brackets references there because that's the element that most maps on to traditional research, book-based research, where you're, you're reading. And in the end, um, you will, if you want to cite other people's ideas from books and articles, you need to reference those in the traditional way. So part of the process that you're engaged in in practice research is that traditional process of reading, making notes on what you read, and keeping very accurate notes and careful documentation of page numbers and bibliographical details so that when you want to use that really excellent quotation that sums up exactly what you, you want to say, you know where it came from and you can reference it in a traditional academic way. I take it that most of you are familiar with that. Yeah. Okay. So again, it's not abandoning entirely what people have done traditionally, it's kind of building a new dimension and drawing upon traditional methods where they're useful. So they're the key adjustments that you need to make to move from being a practitioner to becoming a practitioner researcher. So um, some of these are repetitive, but so processes use build reading and reflection into your work schedule. But um, I haven't mentioned build reading in. That is really important because the, the few unsuccessful, nearly said bad, um, <laughs> practices research projects that I've come across are where people have engaged intensively in a practice and then they've said, oh, but 
maybe I should theorize this. And, and, and sometimes I have to say, driven by supervisors, you know, now you've got to do some reading. And grabbing some kind of high theory, because they believe that's what research has to do. And there really is no connection between the one and the other. One simply doesn't manifest the other at all. So the reading must be part of the ongoing <coughs> process. So in that timeline, the reading schedule needs to be interwoven as well as the critical reflection. Yes, map your conceptual framework since the field of inquiry must fill over several disciplines. And by maps, I mean kind of mind map sort of diagrams. I'm quite fond of those. Now, this first came to my attention when I, I worked with um, a colleague who came out of the German tradition of research. We were co-supervising a practice of research project, and the student was in fact drawing on half a dozen different disciplines, very appropriately in the work. And my colleague said, well, you'll, of course, have to read, as it were, everything in each of these disciplines. And I said, well, how long has she got, you know? <laughs> it just isn't on. So, but it does raise the question then, is how deep or extensive is your reading? It's not <coughs> enough just to pick the choice quotation out of context that happens to suit your research. So, the, the idea of resonances that I articulated earlier is that should, in that process, bring forth the key uh, sources that you're going to draw on. And those are the ones in which you, you need to read more extensively. And then there might be a secondary level of sources in which you've read less extensively. So again, we need to sustain the dimension of traditional academic integrity, that we don't just take a sentence out of context and misrepresent it in some way. And that's, I've seen that happen on many occasions. On the other hand, you can't, for logistical reasons if nothing else, um, be expert in all these cognate fields that you might map across. So that's another kind of difficult thing to juggle, but it is possible. Um, avoid undertaking several projects or PhDs. <laughs> Good advice. Um, and again, I can give a very clear example of this, I think. Quite often, practice research projects claim they're going to have certain kinds of impacts on audiences or in society or whatever. And the question then would be, well, how do you know? Where's your methodology for testing whether they've had those impacts or not? Now, that could in itself lead to a whole other different kind of qualitative or quantitative research project or PhD, and you can't be expected to do that. But you need some kind of method to capture that, if that's what you're claiming. And there are ways of doing that. But you must avoid the things spilling out further and further. So it's like the key to all mythologies in Middlemarch, the Casal one, of course, never finished <laughs> before he sadly died. <laughs> but the reason why um, so many PhD projects historically never get got finished is because they kept going outwards in that kind of way, because research is like that. And I often say to PhD students, look, this is only a PhD. Yeah? It seems such a big thing, but it's only a PhD. It's not your lifelong research inquiry. There are other dimensions of this project that you will go on researching if it's your lifelong research inquiry. What you have to do is carve out this research project and articulate and evidence that, and then you can move on to another dimension. Okay, and think in advance about documentation, including experience and response, and build this into your time scale and budget. So if you need a video camera and you don't own one and you have to buy one, it needs money. <coughs> or, you know, if you're in an institution that can supply one, can you have it always when you want it? You know, these things are, are issues, logistical issues you have to address. One new word I've introduced there is experiencer, and I've claimed coinage of that term. Uh, with a PhD student of mine some 15 years ago, where um, her work was very much, it was a visceral kind of performance thing that she was working with, uh, working with the body-mind. And we, we were talking about spectators and audiences, neither of which seemed appropriate, because it wasn't just about hearing audiences or looking spectators, it was about a whole sensual experience. So we coined the term experience, and as far as I know, that's the first kind I've claimed it. 
It's, it is useful, I think. And also might be useful in the context of um, therapeutic work, where you're working with experiences. It's, it's key. And it does take us back to how, how knowledge is disseminated. I mean, if it's, if it's exchanged through body minds, then it's, it's through that whole experience that knowledge is exchanged, or knowing is exchanged. Right, how am I doing for time, Mary? What, what? You've got about ten. Ten, okay, that's fine, I think. Um, yeah, um, the term methodology in research is always problematic for practitioner researchers, I think. Again, I think it's associated with the scientific method, and it, it's got a kind of echo of methodical, which kind of pulls us back against the quantity of you know, data-based approaches. But methodologies can be, as I say, more akin to creative play than linear rational argument. We then get asked by scientists particularly, well, where is the rigour in your method? And that's a really good question, and I'm working on that at the moment in the book. But there are many ways in which we can articulate rigour of method in our processes, but it's not the same, it's equivalent to the rigour of the scientific method, but it's not the same as. It's not about data sets and certain kinds of um, scale of samples, and it's not about those kinds of quantitative numerical things, because it's not, the kind of knowing that we produce is not measurable in, by those means, but it is measurable in other kinds of ways. That's our challenge, how we articulate and evidence that knowing. So, you know, imaginative creation of material has a rigour. Selection and composition of material has a rigour. Editing material has a rigour. Okay. Oh. Go back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I'll leave that for a moment. So, from the certainty of knowledge to the process of knowing, and I'm going to work through this very quickly because this is a whole historical, philosophical backstory, but I just want to make the point that in the contemporary world, absolute knowledge is in question. I mean, since Einstein, and possibly before, scientists have recognised a relational aspect in the process of knowing. I mean, the theory of relativity is about relatives. I heard somebody saying on the radio the other day in a philosophical talk, and I was delighted, that there's even a performative aspect to Descartes' cogito, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, which is generally taken to, to separate the mind from the body, and the philosopher was saying, well, no, it's a doing thinking. I like that. I like the phrase, doing thinking. And... Most clearly, standpoint epistemologies, which was really perhaps most focused by um, feminists in the 70s, and particularly feminist scientists. And it, it's saying that there, if, there is, if we cannot have absolute universal knowledge, which will be true in all times and places, which, which is the, well, I'd say, we, we, I think we've all abandoned, scientists have abandoned that, then we have to say where we're coming from in relation to knowledge. So knowledge is situated, that's another phrase people use, situated knowledge. We know things mm -hmm. from a particular position. Mm -hmm. And you could say the academy is dominated by white middle class males like me, who come from a particular position, have a particular set of values. And you could say that's what's behind the scientific method. And indeed, feminists, feminist scientists like Donna Haraway, critiqued the, the sort of notional objectivity of the largely white male scientists who dominated the academy. Now, there's big arguments to be had here. But the, the, the point about standpoint epistemology is crucial, I think. So, 
Another thing I think you have to do is say where you're coming from. In my writings, I always declare where I come from as far as I can, share, declare my own values and standpoints. So uh, then when I say what I say from those standpoints, people can know where I'm coming from. And, and, and I hope better understand what I'm saying because they understand where I'm coming from. So, um, if there are relatives in play, can we assume the research inquiry is self-evident in any practice? I'm going to put all these up and then run through them. If signifiers are multi-accented, is that too technical a phrase? Uh, just going back to the word research at the beginning, there were different accents on the word research. So a, a post-structure account of language will say that language is always slippery. No word ever has an absolute fixed and hard meaning. It's, it slides about in different contexts. And of course different languages use different signifiers, different words for different the objects. You know, a dog is chien in French and vomit in German and dog in English. There's, there, there's slippage here. And Derrida would argue that there is never ending slippage in language. Well, we don't need to go into that, but if you just accept the point that language is multi accented So it's de it then becomes dependent on the negotiation of the context to achieve intersubjectively agreed sense. So I don't believe in objectivity, but I do believe we can, and probably should in a research context, aspire to intersubjective agreement. So I'm not an utter relativist. I'm not saying, well, we all see things differently, so what I say is true, what you say is true, what she says is true. There are things that we negotiate into subjectivity. So that process of dialogic negotiation is a key part of research for me. But it does mean, if, 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 things are te if texts are there to be read, then any research practice can't speak for itself because it can't articulate its own context. I'm going to leave that there because that opens a debate that we may not need to go into tonight at all. And then I'm just going to come to a model. So could you pass those rounds? Because what I've got on that screen is not what you're, you've got on the paper. And you can't read what's on the screen anyway. Could you do small? Yep. Right, OK. Five more minutes. So this is the diagrammatic model of, of what I've been saying. It's my, my model of practice research. So we have three kinds of... Oh, I'm not covering myself now. because spare to be for me. <laughs> I do know it more as well by heart. But there's three kinds of, of, of knowing in the, in the different boxes. So the art praxis is in the centre. The practice. But I, I much prefer the word praxis to emphasise and this is my definition, which I've also patented. The dean of my last faculty said I should patent this as the most succinct phrasing of a really complex idea. It's theory imbricated within practice. No, I've never heard that word before. Imbricated, imbricated. yeah. Well, it, it means like that. That's imbrication, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and it's to get round the idea that the theory, that practice is underpinned by theory. That's the common method. It's a modernist mm -hmm. metaphor. It's underpinned by theory. And so if you're engaged in practice, that's all well, but you must underpin it by, by theory. And that's where people start grabbing at theory to make sense. What I'm saying is, if it's intelligent practice, the theory is imbricated within the practice. It's a doing thinking. Now, not all practice is intelligent in quite the way I'm using that in a research context. Because it repeats other practices in a way that, at worst, is formulaic which may have beneficial social consequences in your fields, but it's not research. We're beginning to get that sense of difference. So praxis, I mean, it's an old Marxist word in a sense, but it's theory implicated within practice. So that's at the centre of the thing, and that's why you present the, the, the praxis as evidence of the inquiry and practice research. Circulating around that, and although this diagram is triangular and two-dimensional, it could be prismatic and multi-dimensional, you have no how, you have no what, and you have no that. 
know-how is, and I've got a new version of this, experiential haptic knowing, or insider close-up knowing, experiential haptic knowing, performative knowing, tacit knowledge, embodied knowledge. These are the kind of knowledges you have in doing what you do. Yeah? When you go into a, when you conduct a drama therapy workshop, you have, you have knowledge, and it's embodied. You're comfortable with that, or you're all comfortable with that? Yeah, okay. And you may not even think about it in that way, because it's tacit. And it's probably come from your education, it doesn't come out of nowhere, but you know, you've got it. And in, there's some literal sense of that, I mean, dancers have embodied knowledge in the way their bodies have worked. I mean, you can always tell a ballet dancer, can't you, by the way they hold themselves. That's an embodied knowledge. If you want to learn to dance, do you read a book or do you dance with somebody? It's embodied knowledge and it's passed through the body and the body mind. So, formally, that's kind of phenomenological experience, which I've got on the diagram, and I've deleted it from this one. This is one that's going in the book, by the way, and maybe not finished, but I'm trying to keep this simple. So, there's all this know-how inside a close-up knowing, which uh, practitioners have and aren't aware they have, and very often has an kind of intangible quality, and is underestimated and undervalued in research. So a great, there's a great deal to be understood about that knowledge by making the tacit explicit. So on the kind of left-hand axis there, we're turning know-how into know-what. So how do you do that? Well, the key thing is critical reflection. You know what works. You know what methods you use. You know what principles of composition you use. You know what impacts are achieved by doing certain things. And in research terms, you hope to, you know what's distinctive about your approach, which is going to give this substantial new insight to your research and inquiry. Is that okay so far? Nine? Yeah. And then and it goes both ways, the arrows, very importantly. Then in the, the bottom right hand corner, as it were, is know that, which is outsider distant knowledge. This is the kind of knowledge which is traditional academic knowledge. And in the one on the screen there, it talks about conceptual frameworks. But I simplified that down. I'm still working on this. Spectatorship studies, conceptual frameworks, cognitive propositional knowledge. Spectatorship studies is a phrase coined by uh, a colleague of mine, Middlesex, Susan Melrose, where she pointed out very early in these debates that most knowledge about the arts is from a spectatorship point of view, from people who go and look I would say from the experiencer's point of view. It's not from the practitioner's point of view, it's not insider knowledge. Yeah? So I was at the theatre last night, I could write a review of that piece of theatre from the outside as an observer. It, it, I was an experiencer of it, but I wasn't on the stage, if you see what I mean. The people on the stage had all kinds of knowledge. As it happens, it was a production of Cymbeline in Japanese. So there were all kinds of interesting things about how they understood Shakespeare through the medium of Japanese and what it was like for them to perform a Shakespeare play at the Barbican in, in Japanese. There were all kinds of insider knowledge, which I couldn't access by looking at it. Now, for me, both those kinds of knowledge is important. And what we need to do is kind of join them up, get them in dialogue with each other. So that, again, the arrow is going both ways. So these are the sort of main modes of knowing that I think are in play. And they kind of, I mean, I started out with a triangulation model from social science here. And people have pointed out to me that that's a positive model, knowing that I'm against positivism. But I, I am really still talking about a kind of triangulation of different kinds of knowing. So, um, we are trying to make this, we are trying to articulate an evidence the research inquiry and make it disseminable to other people by whatever means we can. So that it doesn't remain private. I mean, we could just say of know how, well, I know how to do it, but I can't explain to you how to do it. You know, it's just private knowledge. I don't think that's very helpful. It's in a practical context, but it's not very helpful in a research context. On the other hand, 
it's really hard to explain how to dance. You know, it's a real challenge. But if you can get some accounts of how that works and map those on conceptual frameworks which are articulating in a different way how things are working, and if you can, let's say, interview the people involved and get their voices in the frame and capture those somehow, these different accounts begin to triangulate, to use that word, and then the thing begins to amount to more than just separate fragments of evidence. I'm going to take up the audience research dimension. As I say, you can't do a full social scientific research study, but you can interview people to ask them about what they do. So I'm very fond of getting people just use the palm cord and try and get people's responses. You can hold post-presentation discussions. Most arts pra professional arts practitioners show their working process to professional colleagues to get feedback on it. If you record that process, then you're, you get a sense of a critical reflection on, which usually leads to development of. In itself, it, it doesn't amount to a whole body of evidence, but what you end up with is a lot different bits of evidence which, around the model, confirm each other, affirm each other. The practice itself, which does evidence the research inquiry, your account of your own process, the resonance with conceptual frameworks, and any other documentation of the process you can get. So that's how the model fits together. Is that? Okay. Yeah? All right. Right, I'm nearly done because it's time for a break. Um, I'm not going to deal with that one. <laughs> no, I've dealt with this, I think. Yeah, I just emphasized the second bullet point here because I've discussed the first one. But you may be clear about the research dimension, but is it clear to others? Quite often, when I'm talking to colleagues, say, about their practices, their praxis, I say, well, why haven't you talked about this? There's a great example, actually, that, that just come from this afternoon, where a composer colleague was exploring a new mode of um, composition, musical composition, by working with a dancer. And he made a very good DVD documenting, articulating his research questions, giving some examples of process, showing how you work with the dancer, showing the final product. And the complete lacuna in the piece was his key research inquiry, how it affected his principles of composition. Now, as soon as I pointed it out, he said, well, of course, yes. But because he knows that, he doesn't think it's worth saying. Yeah? And it is. It's really important. Okay. So, um, I just, I've just whipped through this because we might come to a different dimension, but I realize, particularly in your kinds of fields, there's all kinds of ethical considerations, particularly about documentation. So, you know, inform, you, you all know all these things, I'm sure, informed consent and voluntariness, confidentiality, anonymity and research integrity, covert research, bioethical context, recording constitutes data. Um, perhaps we'll come back to those if you wish, but you know, it's very easy to say, oh, go away and document the research inquiry, particularly in sensitive fields, it, you know, there's all kinds of issues. It doesn't say it can't be done, and there are established strategies for doing it, but I just wanted to mark that that's so. Uh... So, it's this conclusion here, yeah, that's good. An art or media work or other practice may exceptionally stand on its own as a research <coughs> outcome judged by peer review. So, I, I am suggesting that very rarely the praxis itself might be enough to evidence the research inquiry. Arts or media practices and processes may demonstrate critical rigour and even make arguments, and substantial insights may emerge through play between aspects of the process. I was going to talk about why God's good, but I'm not tonight. I'm going to pause there. I think it's time for a break. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Fine. It's so rich, and I think probably we need. I think what I'd like to ask us to do before we break for tea is just take five minutes on our own to reflect on what we've heard before we go into the bustle of tea and see if there's a question that is important to bring back rather than being led from up front. But let's take just 
five minutes, and then we'll come back about quarter past eight. So a little bit yeah. just to absorb.